Chapter 11, Chapter 12, Appendixes Handbook users frequently want to access specific chapters rather than the entire publication. This website is designed to allow selection, reading, and downloading of individual chapters as Microsoft Word DOC documents. To identify the chapter containing the specific items of interest, click on a chapter number below to upload that chapter in DOC format, or scroll down for more information about each chapter. The guidance in this handbook is not binding on local educational agencies or other entities, except for statutes, regulations, and core decisions that are referenced herein. The handbook is exemplary, and compliance with it is not mandatory. See California Education Code Section 33308.5. Permission is hereby granted to county offices of education and school districts and their agents to reproduce portions of this publication for educational purposes only and not for resale. The source of the material should be acknowledged. Please see the California Department of Education Copyright Statement. A tool is available to assist leaders with calculating blended LCFF funding rates for reorganizing school districts. To request a copy of the instructions and Excel file please contact PASE at cde.ca.gov. Preface Handbook Description, DOC Most people see school districts as stable or even permanent governmental entities. School district boundaries, however, do change. Territory is transferred from one school district to another, districts are divided or combined with their neighbors, and some districts are terminated. This handbook describes how these changes come about. Chapter 1 Introduction, DOC. This chapter lists the source documents, laws, and regulations that are the foundation for the other chapters in this handbook. There are also definitions of common terms used throughout the document. The last section in the chapter discusses the process by which certain functions listed as the responsibilities of the County Board of Supervisors may have been transferred to the County Superintendent of Schools. Back to Top Chapter 2 History of School District Organization in California, DOC This chapter will be useful to community members, school district administrators, and county committees on school district organization alike to know the history of the changes in school district organization. The chapter discusses the various methods used over the years by the legislature to attempt consolidation and overall reduction in the number of school districts. Back to top. Chapter 3 Organization and Responsibilities of the County Committee, DOC. The County Committee on School District Organization has a major role in the review and approval of proposals to change school district organization in the county. This chapter discusses how the members are selected, how committees should function, and how they are financed. In 32 counties in this state, the functions of the County Committee on School District Organization have been transferred to the County Board of Education. A list of counties in both categories can be found at the end of this chapter. This chapter will be of greatest help to County Committee members and to County Superintendents of Schools. They can use this chapter to aid them in calling elections and meetings for the County Committees. Back to Top Chapter 4 Roles and Responsibilities of the State Board of Education and the California Department of Education, DOC. This chapter discusses the authority and responsibilities of the State Board of Education and School District Organization and the assistance and support provided to the State Board by the California Department of Education. The chapter distinguishes between the roles of the County Committee on School District Organization and of the State Board. Petitioners and County Committee members alike will find it useful in understanding what happens to school district organization proposals after the County Committee has acted. Back to Top Chapter 5 Reorganization of School Districts in California, DOC this chapter describes step-by-step step the process of forming or abolishing school districts, consolidating school districts, transferring territory from one district to another, and unifying school districts. Anyone involved in school district organization, 
from petitioners to members of the State Board of Education, will find this chapter useful in understanding legal requirements. The complete process is outlined, including the 25% petition process, the 10% petition process, the guidelines and rules followed by the State Clearinghouse in the Governor's Office of Planning and Research and Administering the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, and regulations. Following each chart, the major requirements of reorganization proposals and the review and approval process are discussed in detail. Section A provides a concise overview of the procedures used in reorganizing school districts. At the end of the chapter are checklists to aid county office staff and county committees in tracking required tasks associated with district reorganization. Back to top. Chapter 6 Legal Criteria Governing Reorganization Proposals, DOC. This chapter discusses the requirements of EC Section 35753 in detail and how the State Board of Education would apply the criteria of Section 35753. Any school district reorganization proposal presented to the County Committee and State Board of Education must meet those requirements. Both the State Board of Education and County Committees on School District Organization are required to evaluate a reorganization proposal and make determinations that the criteria are substantially met. The chapter will be of particular value to members of County Committees who assist them in understanding the legal criteria governing reorganization proposals. Upon receiving the plans and recommendations for a proposal from the County Committee, the State Board of Education must hold public hearings on all petitions other than those involving transfer of territory, EC 35752. The State Board of Education also may review a petition for any reorganization, including a territory transfer, upon an appeal by the chief petitioners of the affected school districts. Appeals of decisions made by county committees to the State Board of Education are allowed under the provisions of EC Sections 35,710.5 and 35,711. The State Board may approve proposals for the reorganization of districts if the Board has determined, with respect to the proposal and the resulting districts, that all the minimum conditions under EC 35753 are substantially met. These conditions, the statutes and regulations governing the conditions, and guidelines to evaluate the conditions are listed below. EC 35753. Back to top. Chapter 7 Public Hearings and Election Procedures, DOC. This chapter lists the requirements for elections and public hearings as they pertain to school district organization, presents the calendar for elections, and discusses setting the area in which to conduct the elections. The area of election has been the subject of several significant court decisions, making this chapter of particular value to legal counsel involved in school district organization proposals. County committee members and petitioners for school district organization change will also find the information useful. Back to top. Chapter 8 School District Formation Guidelines, DOC. This chapter provides information for newly elected governing boards, administrators, other staff, and constituents. A management plan encompassing the interim and operational periods should be prepared as a foundation for the formation of a school district. Section 8, the interim period, provides guidelines on tasks to be accomplished in the time span between the date of the successful election and July 1st of the following year, the date on which the new district becomes fully operational for all purposes. During this interim period, the new district is organized administratively and significant policy and planning decisions must be made. Major components are defined and included in a formal written management plan. Table 8.1 is a worksheet listing tasks to be accomplished during the interim period. Section B, the design period, uses the management plan to define how the district will operate day to day. Table 8.2 is a worksheet listing tasks to be accomplished during the design period. Section C, the implementation period, 
discusses the school system's implementation master plan, which specifically identifies all systems supporting the school district. This plan serves as a blueprint to give direction to the incoming operations team and as a reference for the governing board, providing accountability to the community. Table 8.3 lists major tasks to be accomplished during the implementation period. Sections of this chapter contain lists of issues to be considered by a new governing board when a new school district is established. They are not necessarily applicable to all new districts and should not be considered exhaustive lists. Each governing board of a new district needs to address issues relevant to that specific district. As with other areas of school district organization, guidance from experts, including legal counsel, familiar with local issues should be sought. Back to top. Chapter 9 The Effects of School District Organization DOC. This chapter lists the various effects of a school district organization change on a school district and its employees, property, funds, obligations, bonded indebtedness, and revenue limit. This information is valuable to diverse groups during the processing of a school district organization proposal. An understanding of the legal requirements will be useful to petitioners, electors, and county committees when considering whether a school district organization proposal should be recommended for approval. New governing board members also will find this chapter useful because these requirements must be implemented once the school district organization proposal has been approved and a majority of the voters in the district have voted in favor of the proposal. Back to top. Chapter 10 Other Functions of the County Committee, DOC. County committees on school district organization have additional responsibilities in processing proposals regarding the structure, membership, and areas of representation of members of school district governing boards. These requirements are unique to county committees and constitute a major portion of their workload. This chapter is particularly important for committee members. Back to top. Chapter 11 The Appeals Process, DOC. Chapter 11 provides a brief summary of the appeals process related to transfers of territory from one school district to another, the issues that may be appealed, the timeline, the steps the appellant must follow, and the options available to the State Board of Education are presented. This chapter will be particularly useful to individual petitioners or school districts contemplating the filing of appeals with the State Board of Education. Back to top. Chapter 12 Procedures for Reorganizing Community College Districts, DOC. The legal requirements for district reorganization that apply to community college districts are discussed in this chapter. Procedures affecting community colleges are included in this handbook because county committees on school district organization have responsibilities affecting the community college districts. Legal requirements covering post-secondary education may be found in EC. Division 7, Community Colleges, Section 70,900 at SEC. Specific information on community college district reorganization or formation is covered in Part 46, Chapters 1 through 5, Section 74,000 at SEC. See also Section G in this chapter. Otherwise, the functions performed by the State Board of Education for school districts serving kindergarten through grade 12 are performed for community college districts by the Board of Governors of the California Community Colleges. The legal requirements affecting community college districts are published here for the convenience of the county committees on school district organization. Back to top. I thought that was a great review. I'm going to uh, save it and share it as all states are different when they come to public education. But believe me when I say that all parents have rights. And so, you know, this is another one. I'm gonna let me see if we can read this and we're sharing this. So like it all, so like it all. And then we can just read along. Oh no, we can't, we can't do that. I have to find out where I got that from. But anyways, 
I'm going to keep on trying to help empower other families and parents and community people because we cannot continue to have a failing public education system when it's not working for everyone. I mean, parent involvement is a combination of a commitment to active participation on the part of the parent to the school and the student. But there are many concerns with all that are involved and with concern with involvement. Many secondary schools simply do not know how to deal with the non-traditional family and the areas of concern that it represents. Parents feel unwelcome at school, lack knowledge and education, and they may not feel important. The number of solutions that can be, that can improve parent involvement is substantial. The most important of these, however, is the principal at the school site. To, to be totally committed, when it comes to these solutions that are implemented, the key uh, implemented, the effects are great, especially for a student. Improvement of the student's achievement is a key objective. So then they have this little thing about parent involvement, education and parent involvement in secondary schools and and problems and solutions and effects. Parent involvement is almost any form of procedural, uh, the, any form that produces measurable gains in the student achievement. And I guess this was a lawsuit, Dixon versus Dixon, 1972, page 16, the concept of parent involvement. And the school is vital and can produce rewards for all concerned. How is it that, how, However, it can be found that schools do not always know the term, uh, what the term parental involvement really means. Vandergriff versus Green in 1992. According to Vandergriff and Green, they are two key elements that work together to make up the concept of parental involvement. One of these is a level of commitment to the parent support. This includes things that as encouraging to students being sympathetic reassuring and understanding. And then number two is the element needed to, that is needed for parental activity and participation, such as doing something that is observable and the combination of that level and commitment of active participation. And this is what makes parent involvement. And then it has another, this lawsuit right there. And it talks about the problems. So we review these problems. Problems. Parent involvement actually declines as students grow older. And I got to tell you that, you know, as my children continue to progress in the education system, by the time they got to middle school, the staff was telling me, oh, you really don't want to be here. Oh, yes, I did. Oh, uh, you know, it wasn't an encouraging thing, but I participated anyway. I saw, I mean, I ran for my school site council chairs and I was elected and served. And I also ran for the district advisory chair. And I was, because I was the school site council chair, I got to participate in the district level advisory committee. But, you know, I don't even believe they have a district level advisory committee here as where all of the parents and the participants at the SOT, school, whatever, I mean, they don't talk and they're not providing any training, not that I know of. And when I look at them, outcomes. And when I look at what they're saying their commitment is to children, it's not. It's to themselves. And it's to the refusal to understand that all children are actually, you know, that's their right to have an education that would sustain them after 12 years of the investment of the public dollars as we all pay. So one of the, one of the reasons concerns that lack understanding of non-traditional family on the part of the school system. The non-traditional family is struggling to deal with many factors that affect many, every family member. These can be identified, uh, these definitely affect the way families is able to be involved in the student's education. Like, you know, if the parents, both the parents work and they're not home, they don't have time or, you know, and, you know, where they live, uh, and everything is an issue because, you know, education happens from the side of town that you live on. And quite frankly, we just need to understand that. More likely there is a sabotage. There is a, what is this? There is a shortage of time. There's justly 
just simply not enough hours in the day to accomplish everything. If there has been a divorce or a death in the family, there's probably has been a change in the financial standing of the family. And they, you know, they don't have to acknowledge that. They don't even have to acknowledge that you don't, you're homeless, you know, but they're supposed to. By the school not being sensitive to these changes, a student and family could be embarrassed. And the very nature of the family structure is in a state of change causing confusion and insecurity. And then I guess this was a lawsuit. You see how people have come together to advocate for their children and advocate for themselves. The parents may be doing so. They just might be doing their very best. And that's what it's just saying. Okay. It's saying schools must understand the lack of participation by parents doesn't necessarily mean that they are neglecting their responsibility. They may not just have the time and resources and know how to help out. And see, all of these court cases were brought about by people coming together and attempting to demand some level of accountability to ensure that access is happening for all children. Because, you know, when we live in a community and the community is resisting change, that's what I'll say, because change is really you know, it's difficult because people become used to being able to control themselves. But when they're not benefiting you, then that's when people need to come together and stand up. Oh, wow. Let's see. Principals are the key contributors in helping parents and educators understand each other. That would be good if you had a good principal that was open and willing to allow everyone's voice to be heard, but help. We're living in Las Vegas and the governing board refuses to acknowledge that I write to the board and I'm writing to uh, their person that's over equity consistently. And I never get a response. Initially he was meeting with me, but then he just kind of like faded away and they just continue to do what it is they do. But I'm gonna tell you, Failure is not an option for a targeted population of children who would be at risk. So when we're looking at the way that they're allocating the funds, let me tell you, they are not thinking about you, even if you are generating the funds because they are so stuck on this whole harmless clause that went away. I mean, it actually went away when Obama was in office and they're just refusing to acknowledge it simply because COVID, I'm sorry, this was their last year to engage in what they say they were doing, reorganization, to address the equity issue. And equity is just a goddamn joke here in Las Vegas because they're unwilling to allow people from the community to demand some level of accountability in which we live in this community and pay taxes. So I'm sorry for Jesus Jara and you know the Clark County School District simply because I have never had an opportunity to sit down and talk with the man, but it really doesn't matter because I am positive that he knows what I'm saying because if I'm communicating with his chief person over integration and I'm positive he's sharing the information with the superintendent and the board members and then uh, with Miss Linda Young who is retiring from the board who was representing you know, the, her area who was consistently ignored for the African-American children, her voice was just not strong enough or she didn't have enough people behind her that was willing to stand up and demand accountability from a system that has been established in America, which is called public education. And the mere fact that public education is compulsory in nature. And what do I mean when I'm talking about compulsory? I will tell you. I am talking about we pay taxes and the requirement for your child to get an education is mandatory. In every state, in all of the 50 states, your children have to attend public schools. Now, if the public school system is just bringing about hardship, I mean, they first must not do harm and they are doing harm to the community, to a separate position as they have taken on that they're only willing to deal with children's behavior. Well, of course, education is behavior. And of course, education is a modified behavior, but we really have to be able to measure the maintenance of effort and the benefit. 
Well, when people choose not to measure what they're doing and they focus on sharing the revenue and they make your children revenue and they bust your children all over the county because you know they do that to ensure that they have enough poverty children in a program or a school that would represent Title I and the money for the Title I children actually making it there. But then they have awarded themselves what did they award themselves? The ability to transfer children and put them in programs during the school year and not transfer the student attendance. Now, what is that? A program is not an educational option, I'm sorry. When you partner with a community partner, that third party person is not responsible to ensure that education happens. No, it's not. I mean, it's supposed to support. That's what special education is about. Supporting children and making transition to the benefit for themselves. But when we're not benefiting our children, then what are we doing? Because quite frankly, I will tell you, public schools and the pipeline to prison is real. Public schools and Saturday schools or you know programs that actually deal with redirection and punishment, real. But if there's no core curriculum being measured for the maintenance of support for those children and you've given them additional support and behavior modification, what are you doing? And when you can create a, well, a very detailed system, it says Clark County School District Multi-Tiered System of Services Behavior Incident Decision Flowchart. Now, what in the hell is that? It's something that doesn't teach what the behavior that you're first trying to avoid. And it doesn't talk about the responsibility of the organization to even train in an area. But all of a sudden, all these people who have credentials supposedly become staff psychologists and they start documenting children who are refusing to do the work. Now, what did I just say? Children who refuse to do the work. Now, I didn't say children who cannot read, did I? No. But when they start giving your child a grade of D and D minus and F and still promote your child to the next grade level, what the hell do you really think is going on? It's called pimping. Shit. I mean, come on now. Somebody has to help me with this. I'm trying to understand then how children are consistently promoted and promoted right on out of school. And then I realized that Clark County had done or Nevada had done what helped them the most. You see, in Nevada, they have created five different levels of promotion out of the public school system. They have an adult diploma that was created under, what is this? Nevada Administrative Codes. I see I got that, NAC 389.017. A diploma which evidence the graduation. Now see, you can't even, somebody who wrote this can't even write a damn sentence. So a diploma which evidence the graduation from high school of a person who has met the requirements for graduation through, listen to me now closely, number one, an adult high school program, which established was established by the district. Now, what is that? I don't know. It's not the same access and they're not, believe me, I don't know what that looks like. And I don't even understand how they measure it because you know, a little bit ago, I did what the board thought that their responsibility was to ensure access was happening for all teachers. But oh no, I don't know what that was. And see, this is another um, avenue is sometimes overlooked, inviting parents to volunteer. Many parents are more than willing to share their knowledge of their occupation. And it's so true because, you know, our cities have people who are working for organizations who might be connected to real support that we could bring in and partner with. But guess what? We can't do any of that because they're not willing to hear anyone except for who, who them, themselves. Wait a minute. Uh, number one, an adult high school program that has been established by the district, or number two, an alternative program for the education of pupils at risk 
of dropping out of school, establish my a local district. Now, what the hell is that? I haven't figured that shit out. But then they talk about this program that's so wonderful all the time. It's called Harvard. And it's the, you know, prevention step before you go to juvenile hall, that is. And it, it was created under, now this is different, NRS 388.537. So NRS are, is the Nevada, you know, legislators. I believe that, and then they jump back and forth. And then they even go to a damn assembly bill. An assembly bill, which a diploma is awarded to a student with significant cognitive disabilities who passes some alternative prescribed by the State Board of Education. I don't know what the hell that is, but then they have this college and career, then they have the standard, and then they have an advanced diploma. I mean, but come on now, where do you want your child to be? Understanding that we're all equal in America and understanding that we all have voices and we all should be seeing that we want to demand accountability for the public education system here in Las Vegas, Clark County, which is the entertainment capital of the world, which provides a public service sector and everybody basically who works in Nevada works in public services because when Corona hit, well, all those damn jobs just shut down. So we're gonna wait and see how they're willing to provide support to all these people who are set up to be evicted and, and have to feel like most people in poverty did this whole time. Because there were families in poverty that didn't have roofs over the head and they were still expected to participate in the process. There were families that just didn't have a place to lay their head or sleep or anything. And there was no partnership with, you know, the Housing and Redevelopment Agency, I don't know what it does here, or the Welfare Office, because I don't know what it does here, or the Department of Health and Human Services for Behavioral Health. I don't know how that works because it's a whole different agency that doesn't have anything to do with the core curriculum and the progress of how children are being educated. So did you get an understanding of what the expectation should be from the Clark County School Board when they did their little presentation? No, I didn't understand what they were talking about. And so their presentation was basically irrelevant because it didn't demonstrate how the maintenance of effort and how each school would support children who were not learning. No, it didn't talk about the requirements and, and they've never prevented, I mean, they presented data one time, I think it was in 2014 when they first transferred to local control. But see, before that, I think they were state run. And I think the state just did everything for them. And the state is continuing to do everything for them. But I mean, you know, even creating these pathways of transition to people who cannot take care of themselves and how unfortunate that is. So just because they don't value your input doesn't mean that you need to go away. No, no. We can talk about what workshop of what good parenting skills are. And, you know, about language handicaps and about dual languages, you know, just understanding that we all have to be responsible for the lack of maintenance when it comes to public education, especially since we all pay taxes. So, no, it's unfortunate that, um, that we're all Americans. I believe that. Simply, you need to believe and understand that my experience and knowledge over the time that I've invested in the public school system has enabled my children to be successful. And they're not, you know, they're not on the top of their game either because no, my sister lived in El Grove. The educational system was much better and they didn't have to struggle with the incompetence of, of you know, certain unqualified teachers. And Sacramento is simply just as bad as Nevada when it comes to documenting children with willful defiance issues, because somehow they feel that special education should take their responsibility away. And they don't have the responsibility to help those kids because those kids have some kind of disability, right? Oh, right. All kids can learn. And we know that. And because all children can learn, the board has to have board approved public policies that if they present documentation about how they're supporting children, that the board has approved it. 
I mean, how do they just keep on putting out this crap that doesn't make any sense as work that they're doing? And how are they devastating our, our community? Because really, I mean, children have to have skills. They have to have support and they have to be demonstrating that support is actually happening for them. And no, I'm not satisfied with um, the outcomes of public education here in Nevada. And that's why I'm encouraging more and more community people to understand that we all have the obligation to ensure that all children are being supported. And so until I get ready to come back on again, because I have tons of things to say, but this one was just about parent involvement and the responsibility of community to ensure that access happens for all children. And also I wanted to review what Clark County says is their role in the oversight process so that you could see that they really don't understand what they're talking about. So until we meet again, I'm gonna stop the share. I'm gonna end the recording.